when we do read it and we see the examples that we have, whether they're good or bad, that we can reflect upon our own lives and, and take things away from it that we can make our lives better and that we can help glorify you in our walk in this life and that we can glorify you as well, Father. I watch over those of our number that were unable to be here this evening, that they can uh, recover if they're not feeling very well or they can prioritize you in their life that uh, to the point where they can set things aside and, and make it a habit to, to be here with us, Father. Again, we're thankful for what you do for us each and every day. Help us to be more grateful and help us to see those things that you provide to us each and every day. It's your son's name that we pray. Amen. If you'd like to grab a songbook and turn to Psalm 238. We get at Psalm number 238, Holy, Holy, Holy. We'll sing just the first and the fourth verse before we have titles. Tonight we're going to be looking at the last few kings of Israel and, you know, it just makes you think about, as you know, I always think about, well, how will I start my class? But, it, you know, today I was thinking about, this is an example of why God doesn't put men where God should be. You know, Jesus is the true king. And in the history of the church, you know, you have these guys, you know, some guys are king for like a month and some are king for just a year, six months, like all these things. And they're all doing evil. Uh, Jesus has been king for several thousand years and the kingdom has been stable and strong the way God intends his kingdom to be. And this is just a contrast for us to, to learn to appreciate, you know, uh, God's way is better. And yielding to God and following God, uh, there is definitely blessings of wisdom in just the way a kingdom goes, but also in uh, leadership and guidance and all those things. We just see a stark contrast and we can really feel blessed and thankful that our king is not like these kings. Uh, not America, but in, our, in the kingdom of God. So let's go ahead and begin. A uh, little bit of review. Joash, Amaziah, and Uzziah. These are the last three kings of Judah that we've talked about. Um, Joash, uh, what it says about him is he did right while Jehoiada was, the priest was alive. So with Joash, um, he had a guy who influenced him for the good. But as soon as Jehoiada died, um, his pride got the better of him. He ends up murdering Jehoiada's son, Zechariah, for prophesying against him. And then the people rose up, or a few people, uh, rose up and murdered him uh, because he murdered Zechariah. So everything fell apart when he stopped seeking after God. Amaziah, 
he did right for a while. Um, he was putting together an army. He got some mercenaries. A prophet came and said, you know, don't use the mercenaries. Uh, go ahead and leave those guys behind and God will give you the victory. And he listened. He went and conquered Edom. And then uh, he took the idols from Edom and started worshiping them himself. And he got a little big for his britches and uh, threatened the king of Israel. And the king of Israel, who was a very battle-hardened and powerful king, said, look, you did good. Don't go, you know, what do they say? Don't get ahead of your skis. Um, and the guy didn't listen, and he was conquered because of his pride. Uh, Uzziah was a good king, uh, had some victories, very powerful uh, in fact, you know, fortified Jerusalem to a level it hadn't been fortified before and also brought in some uh, technology that, drew, that uh, was new technology for the time, you know, catapults and uh, trebuchets and, and ballistas and, and different sort of probably de strategic defense elements. Um, and he felt got a little bit full of pride and decided, I'm going to go burn incense myself, and the Lord struck him with leprosy, and he went from being a famous king to being an isolated leper in one day. Uh, so you, in all of these cases, it really highlights what is the impact of pride in your life? What does it do when you l allow pride uh, to begin to rule in your heart? And that's really what we see here, is just the, it, it's, a, it's a very good object lesson. Three kings in a row, almost the same pattern. They weren't bad men completely. They allowed pride to stand in there. And another thing that happened that I think kind of fits with this, go ahead, Mark. It was some form of pride because obviously he knew God, but he chose to serve other gods also, and that was his choice. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, it's hard. To, I, I, I can speculate, you know, on, you know or, or even like, let's just say someone did a convincing curse on him or something. And he thinks, okay, as long as I honor this God, that curse won't come true. I mean, who knows the reason why? I mean, there, but I can think of conceivable reasons. But the reality is, is he decided this is God too. And that was not God deciding that. That was him deciding that. Um, and, and in each case, there was something else that took place that I think is worth note is they did right in the sight of God, but they didn't take away the high places. And I think this is also something that we can pay attention to because there's a lot of people who will do right in the sight of God, but they will reserve in their heart some high places, some things that run contrary to God that they leave unaddressed. And I think that is uh, also something we can pay attention to. That's something that might cause us to stumble as well. Um, these little things, you know, that you reserve back, that you don't conquer in the name of Jesus, and it can be a trouble for you, um, and, and a, lot, a lot of times is. Um, Mike. Yeah, and, and to me, it's, it seems to be, um, you know, you're right that the people like their high places. And it takes a, a certain level of political capital that people aren't going to like you when you tear down their high places. Uh, so even though he says, okay, I'm not willing to do it, I'm not willing to remove it either. And it seemed like it was a, um, what does it say in 1 Timothy? Don't let a root of bitterness in your heart and it's just the idea of letting anger simmer and it's the same sort of thing as it was kind of like a root of sin just a just a stronghold 
for Satan to deceive the people. And another aspect of this is you see Satan's generational patience to cause a nation to fall. Especially in Judah, where you had a lot of good kings intermixed with bad kings, but Satan just continued applying pressure until things started collapsing. And, and so when you allow him to have that foothold, he is patient and deliberate in, in how he, he approaches it. So they had, it's, Judah had a run of good kings, but they held on to some of the evil that was ultimately going to be the downfall of the nation. And, and after uh, tonight, we're gonna, we'll be done with Israel. We'll just be looking at Judah. And you're going to see really the kings of Judah go like this. Um, there's been pressure building. And we're seeing it. That, you know, this is kind of the, some of the side effects of that pressure where the next king is going to be King Ahaz. He's going to go headlong into um, sin. In fact, he'll be offering his sons into idols. Like that's where he's going to end up. So pretty, pretty. Um, it's going to go into evil pretty quickly. So let's go back to Israel. Um, our the last king of Israel. Now I'm Jeroboam the second. Uh, he is the third generation from Jehu. So Zechariah is the fourth. Yeah, it's the fourth generation from Jehu. I'm making sure I have my facts straight. Um, and, and in Israel, the common theme is they did evil in the sight of the Lord. You don't have any redeeming qualities from the kings of Israel. 19 kings, I, I, I read it, I think I, I read in a commentary, or maybe it must have been in a commentary. 19 kings of Israel, every one of them did evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, all but one followed the sin of Jeroboam. So that's kind of an interesting uh, aspect to it as well. But here we have uh, kind of this promise God made to Jehu that because he lined himself up with the will of God in destroying Baal worship out of Israel, God said, because of that, I'm going to allow your sons to sit on the throne for four generations. Uh, he still didn't depart from the sin of Jeroboam, the original sin uh, of Israel, but he did get out of the sin uh, th that uh, he did get out of the sin of Baal worship, and God was pleased with that. So uh, he had this promise. So let's go ahead and pick up uh, 2 Kings 15, verse 9. Uh, here we just get a brief uh, overview of the heart of Zechariah. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done. He did not depart from the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. So here, he does evil in the sight of the Lord. He's not a good king. He's worshiping at the uh, golden calf worship, and he has an evil heart. Now let's take a look at his reign, starting in verse 8. It says, In the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, became king over Israel and Samaria for six months. So, now God did say four generations. <laughs> that fourth generation, he was not very patient with. Uh, he got, he uh, got rid of him quickly. So he was king for six months. Uh, he followed Jeroboam. Uh, and uh, there's the next king. His name is Shalom. And Shalom basically rose up against him and murdered him. Look in verse 10. It says, Then Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and struck him before the people and killed him and reigned in his place. Now the rest of the acts of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. And we don't happen to have that book, so we never really get to know the rest of the acts of Zechariah. But six months can't be a very long history uh, in this. Uh, but he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 12. This is an important verse. This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Jehu, saying, Your sons to the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel, and so it was. I think this is an interesting thing. You know, I love this prophet that, that wrote this. He makes a point of going back and looking at um, prophetic utterances and saying, now it's been realized. He's done this multiple times through the course of this study. But this is just a, a reminder that God is a God who keeps his promises. Even, in this case, to an evil lineage of kings. 
they could count on sitting on the throne because God gave his word. And this is also a reminder to Israel um, or the people who were brought into captivity from Israel, more likely, that God did keep his promises because Israel in captivity is going to have some promises as well. And this is a reminder, you can trust in the Lord in this. These, the writings of these kings is also a reminder, don't go back to what you used to be. Uh, so that's what we see here. Uh, to the fourth gen, or God's word was kept. And we can go back to 2 Kings 10 verse 30. If you want to you know, write a side note in your Bible, that's where the original promise was. And it talks about Jehu lining up his will with the will of God in, that, in, in the eradication of Baal worship. So Shalom becomes king. Now he uh, had some big plans. He murdered the king in front of the people. So it wasn't this private secret thing. He just murdered him outright. Uh, set himself up as king. Uh, he, look in 2 Kings chapter 15, starting in verse 13. Shalom, son of Jabesh, became king in 39th year of Uzziah, king of Judah. He reigned one month in Samaria. So we have the calendar up there just to symbolize, you know, that's as long as he got, king for a month. It doesn't mention his heart, and probably, probably we can deduce, though, what it was. Um, he murdered somebody to become king. Likely he did evil in the sight of the Lord, although it doesn't actually mention it in his case. Uh, so king for a month, murdered Menahem. Uh, and so you start seeing this pattern emerge in these final kings. Guy becomes king, he's murdered. Guy becomes king, he's murdered. Um, the next guy is uh, Menahem. He's going to murder Shalom and become king. So we start seeing this pattern. But uh, I want to just take a quick moment and take a look at Hosea, who wrote contemporary to this time period. And, 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 what, or, yeah, and Hosea just makes some comments related to the state of the kingdom of Israel. Yeah. I might be a little bit confused about this, but I'm, I'm kind of looking back at Jane and I were talking about it. So Zechariah, I don't want to back up, but Zechariah became, in the, in, the, in the 38th year of Azariah, the king of Judah, he became king. But then Shalom, in the 39th year of Uzziah, became king. My math isn't adding up. Azariah and Uzziah are the same guy. It's weird. I don't know why they switched the name like that. But if you go to 2 Chronicles, he's always Uzziah. But in 2 Kings, he's Azariah and Uzziah. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. It's just confusing. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yep. You know, I actually had the same thing. So I had to like, I was like, who's Azariah? I don't remember. Like, it's not in my list that I was working off of. Like, who is this guy? And I had to figure it out. So. Um, you're in good company, Rick. So, all right. Uh, Hosea chapter seven, verse one. Uh, when I so here's just gives you a sense of what's what's it like in Israel at this point in time. Uh, God says, "When I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is uncovered, and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief enters enters in, bandits raid outside, and they do not consider in their hearts." that I remember all their wickedness. Just stop for a moment. So there's a few things that, that will help us follow this. Ephraim, uh, the reason why he brings up Ephraim, because Jeroboam, the original Jeroboam, was from the tribe of Ephraim. So Judah is named after David, who's from the tribe of Judah, who was the king of, of that region. Uh, Ephraim is the lineage of the first king. So when he says Ephraim, he's talking about the kings specifically, and also Ephraim is the tribe, you know, that led them into their original sin. So that, so you'll see this Israel, Ephraim, and Samaria. Israel's the nation. Ephraim is the kings of the nation. And Samaria is the capital of the nation. It's just basically saying the same thing with different descriptors. So as we, as we talk about that, that just help you follow the text here. But he says, um, they deal falsely. Thieves enter in, bandits raid outside, and they do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. You know, here's something that just is a reminder. God remembers your sins need forgiveness. 
And Israel, uh, for, it, one of the things they did is they, they forgot about that. They stopped. In fact, you'll see a point where they actually pay attention for a minute, almost like Nineveh paid attention for a minute. Um, but that's at the very end. But, they, but what Hosea says is they forgot that God remembers all their wickedness. Um, second part of Hosea 7, verse 2. Now their deeds are all around them. They are before my face. With their wickedness, they make the king glad and the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers, like an oven heated by the baker who ceases to stir up the fire from the kneading of the dough until it's leavened. On the day of our king, the princes become sick with the heat of wine. He stretches out his hand with scoffers, for their hearts are like an oven, and they approach their plotting. Their anger smolders all night. In the morning, it burns like a flaming fire. All of them are like a hot oven, and they consume their rulers. All their kings have fallen. None of them calls on me. Does that sound familiar? All their kings have fallen. None of them calls on me. And that's what you see. Someone goes up, they murder the king, they become king, they do evil in the sight of the Lord. Someone murders him, becomes king, they do evil in the sight of the Lord. It's just the way they are. Is what's on the outside? What, like, if you're out, out of the cities, there are bandits. If you're in the cities, there are thieves. Um, the, the rulers, consumed by getting drunk and, and sinning, and they're all adulterers. You, know, you just start seeing this, this description. How would you like to live in this nation? This is a nation that's forgotten their God. Um, starting in verse 8. Ephraim mixes himself with the nations. Ephraim has become a cake not turned. Strangers does devour his strength, yet he does not know it. Gray hairs also sprinkle him, yet he does not know it. Though the pride of Israel testifies against them, yet they have not returned to the Lord their God, nor have they sought him for all of this. So Ephraim has become like a silly dove without sense. They call to Egypt and go to Assyria. When they go, I will spread my net over them. I will bring them down like the birds of the sky. I will chastise them in accordance with the proclamation to their assembly. Uh, woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction is theirs, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. And they do not cry to me from their heart when they, when they wail on their beds. For the sake of grain and new wine assemb uh, assemble themselves, they turn away from me. And although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. Here's, and it just a, the way God describes this section, it's like someone heartbroken. You know, they have strayed from me. Uh, they've rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies about me. Uh, they, they are on their beds crying and weeping and, and, and pleading for food, but they're not praying to me. Um, and he says, and although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devised evil against me. It sounds like a parent mourning a rebellious child, doesn't it? Just that, that feeling. But it just, it just puts God in the light of a father. And think about how much more the, the extremes of these two statements, right? Israel is extremely evil. Way more evil than, than our rebellious children will get. Way extreme in their evil. And God is very extreme in his love for these people. And although it's required a judgment against them, his heart is all... He's like, I would redeem them. I would forget about all that sin and take them back. But they don't want me. And you just see... The heartbreak of a loving father mourning the loss of a child who has utterly rejected him and, re and, and refuses his plea. Reap the whirlwind. Just kind of an interesting side note. That's where that saying comes from, sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind. What God is saying is their sin is maturing to the point of judgment. 
and it's because of their rejection of God. So Shalom becomes king. It just in this time period, you just kind of see what was it like in Israel, what what was happening in that time period, and you really just see. I think it's helpful just to see Hosea's perspective um, uh, overall the nation. It was just a corrupt place from top to bottom, and uh, very few righteous people left in it. So. Any thoughts or comments on that before we move forward? So let's go ahead and take a look at Menahem. 2 Kings chapter 15, starting in verse uh, 14. Shalom, this, let me, uh, verse 14. Then Menahem, the son of Gadi, uh, went up from Terza and came to Samaria and struck Shalom, son of Jabesh, in Samaria and killed him and became king in his place. Uh, so here you just see... The, there's a little bit of a, there's a couple of aspects. This, this particular king is spread over a couple of chapters because some things happen in between. But this is kind of the summary of, of his, how he becomes king. He came, he murdered Shalom, became king. Now Menahem, I think in verse 18 here, uh, let's see. Yeah, in the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Menahem, son of uh, Gadi, became king over Israel and reigned ten years in Samaria. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made, uh, which he made Israel to sin. So here you just see a quick summary. Uh, his heart, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, not surprising a man who murdered his predecessor. So he does evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, he... Uh, does rule for 10 years. So you have a couple of weaker men who were not able to secure their rule, um, but it seems like in this case he was able to. And I want to just, I think I have a note here. Um, so just a, uh, this is a comment by uh, Josephus, and, and it's not 100% reliable, but I think it, pro it just adds interest because of some of the things he does. It says likely um, Menahem was the general of the army of Israel. Uh, the, the reasons why he makes that statement is, it, I believe it's him. Uh, yeah, I believe it's him. Uh, I believe he, uh, yeah, yeah, he was from Terza, which was um, where the army of Israel what garrison was. And so he comes from Terza, he goes to Samaria, kills Shalom, and then goes back and then conquers that region because they were rejecting him as king. But it seems like he had the military at his command uh, early on. Likely, the, uh, likely Shalom's general who, who saw an opportunity for power and took it. So that's, that's where this guy is coming from. Now, uh, verse, 14, uh, verse 15 through 16, after he gains power, says, now the rest of the acts of Shalom and his conspiracy, which he made, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of Kings of Israel. Then Menahem struck Tib Tifsa and all who were in it and, and its borders from Terza, because they did not open to him. Therefore, he struck it and ripped up all its women who were with child. So here you just have this little statement and it's, um, we'll take a look right here. This will just give us a quick look. So Terza is right here. And um, Tipsha would be just right the next city over. And so when he gets there, uh, he returns as king from Samaria. So you see Samaria is right in this region here. Uh, so he travels, oh, he travels from here, becomes king, comes back. He's rejected. He conquers that town. And in order to make, likely in order to prevent other cities from doing the same thing, because he shows up as king, they don't open the gates. So he not only attacks it, he does it in a very violently aggressive way um, and basically kills all the pregnant women violently. Uh, in order, and, I mean, but think about what, what's the psychological effect of that kind of warfare? You're going to want to mess with that guy? No. And that's likely the reason why he goes ahead and makes that, um, that move there. But it just shows what kind of guy is this? Just, you know, a bloody, you know, a bloody man. Verse 19, it says, Pol, king of Assyria, came up against the land, and Menahem gave Pol a thousand talents of silver, 
so that his hand might be with him to strengthen his kingdom under his rule. Then Menahem uh, ex exacted the money from Israel, even from all the mighty men of wealth, from each man 50 shekels of silver to pay the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria returned and did not remain there in the land. Now the, the rest of the acts of Menahem and all that he did, are, not, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of Kings of Israel? Um, Menahem slept with his fathers and Pekahiah, his son, became king in his place. So here you have him, the Syria. This is the first, I believe, mention of Assyria. I don't know if it's in the book of, in the histories, but at least in the book of 2 Kings, you see Assyria just coming onto the scene as a world power. Uh, this guy's name is Pol. He's a, an Assyrian king, and Israel pays them a thousand talents of silver. How much do you suppose a thousand talents of silver weigh? Yes. Oh, is it right up there? Okay, I forgot I had it. I should have... Uh... You're smart, Rick, so you just made up for... <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, a thousand talents of silver equals 38 tons. Um, uh, glad to see one of you are paying attention. No. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, yeah, 38 tons of silver. Now, that sounds like a lot of silver. If you actually calculate what it's worth today, it's about $23 million. So, I mean, it's a lot of money, but not, I mean, relatively speaking. Go for governments to do things, it's not a lot of money for a government these days. But you have to think, they probably proportionately had a lot less silver available, so maybe had carry a little more worth. Either way, it was enough to motivate the, arm, the king of Assyria to back off and um, not to fight him, but also to support him and maybe help him secure his kingdom a little bit. Uh, so so he, this was one of the things he did. But this is also, just as kind of a side note, we're, and we'll actually see this. Um, actually, in, in Hosea, we saw this. It says, you run to Assyria and Egypt. You know, the, paying off a king stood in the place of faith in God. Every time they're, they're buying off these armies instead of trusting in God to deliver them. And that's what you see here. Is it, it's always that case. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an either or thing. God has been disappointed many times for nations trying to create alliances instead of trust in him and go and face the enemy. Um, but that's, you know, maybe something we can take away from too, is there are times when we just need to face the enemy. We don't need to make alliances. We don't need to avoid problems. Uh, we need to face it and trust the Lord to deliver us. And um, so this is just another element of the evil king that he was is he did not trust the Lord. He paid off his enemies in order to buy himself time. Now, how long do you suppose this worked for? How long do you suppose Syria was um, not hostile towards Israel for 38 tons of gold, silver? Yeah, yeah. Less than 10 years because the next king has to deal with Assyria um, in, a, in a much bigger way. Uh, here's another interest, just interesting piece of history that goes along with this. This is called the Steel of Tiglath Pileser. Uh, that's the next Assyrian king that we're going to see here, uh, here coming up real soon. But he actually written on this steel. You can kind of see how there's like writing on here. You can't see it real clearly, but that, that rough looking texture is actually writing. And it actually has the... Um, the um, money or the silver from Menahem given to the king of Assyria recorded on this, this steel. This is something you can go to a museum and see. So it's just interesting. It's just a piece of history and, you know, an archaeological item that confirms the biblical narrative. And that's always what you find. But I just find, you know, that's just kind of, it's kind of like, you know, what we just read a few chapters ago that this is the fourth generation just as God said, that is the same sort of thing. This says exactly what the Bible says. Uh, I just think those kind of things are pretty cool and confirming because, you know, is the Bible reliable history or not? Well, this would um, testify that it is actually reliable history, particularly because they don't have a record of this particular um, name in Assyrian history. And yet, 
it's showing up in, in Assyrian history anyway. So, uh, so uh, I'm missing a guy. I, I, I have Pika, not Pika Haya. So we're going to have to hold off here for a moment. Um, so I don't think Pika is very notable anyway, but I did forget to put him on here. So Pika becomes king in 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 24. Uh, a big surprise. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Uh, then Pekah, son of Remaliah, the, his officer conspired against him, struck him in Samaria in the castle of the king's house with Argob and uh, Ariah. And with him were 50 men of the Gileadites. He killed them and became king in his place. Now the rest of the acts of Pekahiah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. You know what? I actually got ahead of myself. I didn't talk about Amos at all. Um, but that is basically all we have to say about Pekahiah. He became king and was murdered shortly after. Uh, I think he was king for maybe uh, two years. Or, um, yeah, two years. So he wasn't there very long. Uh, someone rose up against him. And what Josephus said about uh, Pekah rising up against him, I believe he said, let's see. Uh, no, this is the next guy. So it, he doesn't say it. Yeah, he does. Um, he says they slew the king in his very palace with his friends at a feast. So that's what the, a historical record says about this. He slew his friends in his palace at a feast. So um, interesting side note. So let's, I want to jump to Amos real quick. I know we've been going back to Hosea and Amos, but it's, it, it just, I think it's interesting to kind of compare the, the comments to the time. So when Menahem... He gave the money, the silver, to the king of Assyria, and he exacted it from the rich men of Israel. And so here you have this pretty severe tax that he took. And so the question is, should we feel bad for them or not, uh, for the king taking this tax from them? Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look in Amos chapter 4, and we'll get a sense of what it was like in Israel financially at the time, at least to some extent financially. Uh, Amos 4.1, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are in the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. So here is, he's speaking about the women of Samaria who are demanding that their husbands take every last cent from the poor people so they can have their lavish banquets. Um, remember the, on uh, that, the uh, Disney cartoon, Robin Hood, and you have the sheriff of Nottingham like, like taking every last piece of money that those poor people had and they just heartless just collecting it and the king had all this gold like stacked around his castle but his people were starving. That's basically uh, Samaria, Israel in that time period. And, and it, it just shows them is that for their excess, they're demanding that they crush the needy and the poor. Exact opposite of what God would teach is to give of your excess to the needy and the poor. Um, look in uh, Amos chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor... And exact a tribute of grain from them, though you have uh, houses, though you have built houses of well-hewn stone, yet you will not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, and you will not drink their wine. So here's another condemnation of God: is that uh, you are uh, living large while you oppress people uh, for the very homes they live in. So you just see that trying to get rich on, um, you know, the homes of the poor people. Verse 12. For I know your transgressions are many and your sins are great. You who distress the righteous and accept bribes and turn aside the poor in the gate. So here you just see, um, you have, okay, what is the landlords doing? Well, they're raising the rent uh, ridiculously. Uh, what are the, um, the judges and the, uh, and the people who are, have charge of ruling over the people doing? Well, they're accepting bribes and crushing the poor. Uh, it, they are uh, turn aside the poor in the gate. If you don't have something to offer me, 
I'm not even going to hear your case. That's what it's like over there. And so you just kind of see, is, do we feel bad for the king taking this high tax from these people? No, not at all, because they're oppressing the poor to get their money in the first place. Might as well just give it to the king of Assyria um, because of the injustice that's going on in this time period. And then I want to look at one more section. This is Amos chapter 8 and verses 4 through 6. It says, Hear this, you, you who trample the needy to do away th with the humble of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may open the wheat market to make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger and to cheat with dishonest scales so as to, uh, so as to buy the helpless for money and the needle needy for a pair of sandals and that we may sell the refuse of the wheat. So here you just see them trying to sell the worst of, the, of what they have and then cheat when they're weighing out the money and weighing out what they're giving uh, and purposefully taking, a, taking joy in taking advantage of the poor. You just, again, it's just like, think about what is that, I mean, and, and the reason I, you bring, we would bring this up is this is the exact opposite of what God is calling us to do. It is, we are called to be an aid, a help, and to be generous, to, um, wait, to if you're going to do something out of balance, do it out of balance against yourself. Don't take advantage. Don't take what doesn't belong to you. Don't sell the worst of what you have to someone who's desperate to have it. You know, it's just all these things. There's principles of serving God. And so as you read this, you actually see, uh, you know, if you look at the inverse of it, you really see what God would have you to do. Um, and you see God's condemnation against this kind of behavior. But on the other hand, uh, what, what are we called to do? And I know, uh, as I look at it, I know everyone here does, doesn't do it this way. We all do it the right way. We all seek to help and to give more and to be helpful and that's something, you know, if the Lord is disappointed in them and condemning this behavior, then he's got to be praising those who do the right thing. And there are many who do the right thing. And that's a, that is uh, an honorable thing to do. And it's encouraging to look around and know, I know the people I worship God with are that way. I know it. Uh, so, yeah, it's such a blessing to, to have that and, and and such a blessing to be in a, in a, amongst people who hold up God's standard because it's right and because it honors God and because we seek to have him as our God. So now let's go and take a look at Pika. So Pika, he goes ahead and kills Pekahiah um, and becomes king in his place. Uh, look with me in... Second uh, Kings chapter 15 and verse 28. Uh, so, he did evil in the sight of the Lord, did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Here you go, you see the same thing over again. Uh, he, did, he didn't sin. Now, here's an interesting thing that happens in the time of Pekah. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath Pileser, uh, Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured Ejon, and Abelbeth, Makkah, and Genoa, and Kadesh, and Hazor, and Gilead, and Galilee, and all the land of Naphtali, and he carried them away in captivity. So let's just go ahead and um, take a quick look here. So essentially, if you look at, here's Ejon, and here's Genoa, here's Hazor, and Kadesh, and whatever that place was called. So essentially, you get this region right here. Uh, is conquered by Assyria. So um, that leaves us this a southern, actually, Ramoth Gilead is in there. So we, got, we get over here. And um, let's see. I believe that, that, gets, that gets us. So kind of maybe something more like this. Anyway, the point is, is it's the whole northern end of Israel conquered by Assyria. The people deported into captivity so Pika is really king of a very small region at this point. 
And just as kind of a side note to this, um, as kind of a side note to this, there is a period of time, and we'll, I have a, a little chart I made up for this real quick. Um, so there's like nine years missing from this timetable here. And I'll give you the highlight of it uh, here is Pika, 2 Kings 15, 27, Pika is king, reigns for 20 years. So he's only king for 20 years. Now, if you look in uh, 2 Kings 15, 32, Jotham becomes king in the second year of Pekah. Uh, Ahaz becomes king in the 17th year of Pekah. Uh, and Hoshea, oh, this is 2 Kings 15, 30, becomes king in the 20th year of Jotham. So Jotham becomes king in the second year of Pekah. And the guy who murders Pekah becomes king in the 20th year of Jotham. We're already 22 years into it. He was only king for 20 years. Now you back up a little bit. It says in 2 Kings 17.1, or 2 Kings 16.1, Ahaz becomes king in the 12th year of Pekah. Or in the 17th year of Pekah. So 17 years, there's three years left, supposedly. Hoshea be uh, becomes king in the 12th year of Ahaz. So Ahaz becomes king in the 17th year of Pekah, and then he's murdered 12 years later. That's 29 years. So what they assume is, when the king T Tiglath Pleaser uh, comes through, he deposes Pekah for a period of up to nine years. And so Israel's without a king, or really maybe a, or under Assyrian control as he conquers. Um, and then Pekah gets back into power and resumes. It's interesting, they didn't care about chronological order as much as we do. Uh, we can't tell for sure, but there's anywhere between two and nine years unaccounted for in his reign, likely during this time when uh, his nation's being conquered and taken into captivity. Anyway, just kind of an interesting little uh, tidbit in there. They're getting brought off into captivity. Uh, as this happens, then uh, Hoshea rise up and conquers him. There's a few other things I want to talk about uh, here. Um, in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 5, it says, Then Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. So here you just see he teams up with the king of Aram, which his capital is Damascus, and they go to war against Judah, likely trying to recover some of what was lost when the king of Assyria comes through. And Ahaz, now he's the next king we're going to talk about in Judah. He's the guy who's sacrificing his children to false gods. He's not a good guy, but Israel wasn't able to overcome him, although they inflicted heavy damages to him. Look in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, um, and this will give us another side of the story. 28, starting in verse 5. Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Aram, and they defeated him, and carried him away with a great number of captives, and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who, was, who inflicted him with heavy casualties. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, all valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. And Zikiri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew uh, Masia, the, the king's son, and Azrikam, the ruler of the house of Elkanah, the second to the king. The sons of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons and daughters, and they took also a great deal of spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But the prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded, and he went out to meet the army which came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because the Lord God your fathers, uh, because, the, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he delivered them into your hand, and you have slain them in, in a rage which has even reached heaven. Now you are purposing to subjugate for yourselves the people of Judah and Jerusalem for male and female slaves. Surely, do you, do you not have transgressions of your own against the Lord your God? Now, therefore, listen to me and return the captives who, whom you captured from your brothers, for the burning anger of the Lord is against you. 
Then some of the heads of the sons of Ephraim, Azariah the son of jo- Johanan, uh, Berechiah the son of Mesh- Meshelamoth, uh, Jehiz- Jehizkiah the son of Shalom, and Amasa the son of Had- Hadlai, arose against those who were coming from battle and said to them, You must not bring the captives in here. For you are per- proposing to bring upon us guilt against the Lord, adding to our sins and our great guilt. For our, our guilt is great, great, so that his burning anger is against Israel. So the armed men left the captives in the spoil before the officers and all the assembly. Then the men who were designated by name arose, took the captives, and they clothed all their naked ones from the spoil. They gave them clothes and sandals, fed them, and gave them drink, anointed them with oil, led all their feeble ones on donkeys, and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brothers. Then they returned to Samaria. Just kind of an interesting little tidbit where you see them go in, and in battle, they were absolutely ruthless, killing 120,000 people with swords. It's not like, you know, World War II where there's, you know, machine gun nests and that sort of thing. With swords, they just went in there and butchered them, captured their chil- their families essentially of the men they killed. We're gonna enslave them. But then the prophet of the Lord was out there, and it's interesting to me that the nation that all these people were convinced of their guilt by this one man, who stood up and proclaimed the word of the Lord. It just seems out of place. It actually seems a little bit like Jonah going to Nineveh and saying, God's angry with you, and then of a repenting. It seems a lot like that, because they didn't really truly repent, but in this moment, they didn't do what they had intended to do, and they returned their captives back. Um, so I think that's an interesting part of this story. And there's a third part of this that, I, that, that is also interesting. This is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Arameans have capped in Ephraim, his heart and the, peop- and the heart of his people shook as trees of the forest shake with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now and meet Ahaz, and your son, Shear Jashub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take care and be calm, have no fear, and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has planned evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrorize it, and make for ourselves a breach in its walls, and set up the sons of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. Anyway, I just find this interesting, where although he's an evil king, and in Second Chronicles it says, they were able to conquer it because of their evil against God. And at the same time, Isaiah is in there talking to the king, saying, they aren't going to completely conquer you, and they're not putting a new king on the throne. Uh, then you go on, and this is actually the part of Scripture uh, where you get the prophecy of the virgin birth. Isaiah says to Ahaz, ask for a sign as high as heaven. Well, I won't presume to ask a sign of God. He's like, all right, well, I'll give you a sign. A virgin is going to be pregnant, and before that child is old enough to eat curds and honey, the two nations whom you fear will not exist. So, in a couple of years, those nations won't even exist anymore. So, just kind of an interesting thing that although that the long-term fulfillment of that prophecy was Jesus, likely there was another virgin who had a child in that day as a sign to King Ahaz. Just kind of an interesting side note, um, but, but uh, you know, that's a long-term, short-term fulfillment kind of prophecy there. Uh, so uh, you kind of see that, that Pekah went to war. Now Hoshea rose up against him and killed him and became king in Israel in his place. And so let's go ahead and, and go back now and take a look at this. In, in 2 Kings chapter 
uh, 17, verse 2, we get uh, a report of Hoshea. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, only not as the kings of Israel who were before him. All right, we finally get a guy who didn't go after the sin of Jeroboam. Shut it down. Right? This is the last king of Israel. God's going to conquer it. But it's interesting that it was... Um, this guy did not become king at a very good time. I have the Hindenburg on fire here uh, as a picture. That's essentially when he became king in Israel, as at this point uh, in the Hindenburg success. Uh, so it's, it's going up in flames, and he becomes king. Uh, so look in 2 Kings chapter 3 through 6. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him. Hoshea became his servant and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hoshea, who had sent messengers to sow the king of Egypt, and had offered no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. So the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. The king of Assyria invaded the whole land, went up to Samaria, and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried Israel away into exile to Assyria, and settled them in Halah and in Habor, uh, on the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Now, it, now this came about because the sons of Israel sinned against the Lord their God who had brought them up from the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they, and they feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel and in the customs of the kings of Israel which they had introduced. So you see this nation conquered, taken captive, exported to another place. And then it stops and says, because they did not, um, because they sinned against the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt. Now that is an important phrase, the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt. Bringing them out of Egypt was an important point in history where God acted powerfully on their behalf in order to deliver them from slavery. In Hebrews, um, it talks about how if, if, if the words from angels, and really, you know, although God was working, this work of bringing them out of Egypt is significantly less significant, if that's right, is a lot less significant, um, is a lot less significant than the deliverance we had from slavery through the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what it says is, they sinned against the Lord who brought them out of Egypt. Hebrews 2, if the word of angels proved inalterable and every transgression received its just penalty, how much closer should we pay attention to the Son of God? But it's just as a reminder to us is, uh, the things we do in service to God matter. They are important. They catch the recognition of the creator of all things, for good or for evil. And we need to remember that. So we remember to, to fear him and to follow him and to seek his forgiveness. And he's willing to forgive if we have hearts that are willing to repent and to follow after him. And so here you see, finally, the end of this uh, kingdom of Israel. It's a final collapse. This is the year 721. Uh, it will be less than 50 years before the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed. So we're now on this downward trajectory. In that 50 years, you're going to have a couple of good kings in Judah, um, but then the end is going to come. And we just finished in our, uh, in our uh, Tuesday study, studying Ezekiel, and that really takes place immediately after. And actually, during this time period, uh, Ezekiel is in, uh, is in Assyria. Now, he's not with these captives. He's actually with the captives of Judah after, I believe, 606. But he's over there with those captives foretelling the fall of Jerusalem, and comforting the people. So we get another perspective from Ezekiel. Uh, what are these people in captivity hearing? And from what we understand, the first 33 chapters of Ezekiel is essentially God saying, 
you preach even if no one listens to you, Ezekiel. And they were hard-hearted and stubborn and rejected him. And Ezekiel's preaching was tough, what he had to do. And then the temple fell. And from that point forward, Ezekiel, all he had to do was preach comfort to the people because they realized every word he said from the mouth of God, every word he spoke on behalf of God came to pass. And so you kind of see this other area where God's calling them to repentance by showing them, even in their stubborn sinfulness, calling them back to him and, and over time is effective. So you kind of just see that the other end of this is these men are going off into captivity. The ones who are going into captivity are the ones that have a chance to change still. And the Lord's not going to give up on them. He's going to continually call them back. And I think Jeremiah reaches out to them uh, through the course of his ministry as well. Because Jeremiah is also going to, he's been on the scene, but he's kind of coming in in Jerusalem to foretell the end of that nation as well. So that's kind of where we're at the end. And we'll pick up with the kings of Judah and finish out that uh, that lineage um, in the the coming weeks. Uh, So any thoughts or questions before we close? All right, if not, let's go to God in prayer. Our great God and Father in heaven, we come to you at this time. And Lord, we're so uh, grateful to be able to read these things and, and, and have an understanding of of what you want from us, Lord. Thank you for giving us examples to learn from what not to do in this case. And uh, pray, Lord, that we would uh, follow these examples, that we would um, remember what it means to turn our back on you and to, uh, to, to walk in pride and to ignore your laws and statutes that you've given us for our own good. Pray, God, that we would have hearts to follow you and that you would... Um, give us strength to serve you as you would have us to do, uh, that we could be a, not a nation who is condemned by you, but a nation that is praised by you uh, as, um, as your people, dear Lord. Uh, we thank you. We pray, God, as we go into this week, that we finish off this week, that we, all that we do, uh, we seek to bring glory to your name, that we seek to look to the benefit of our community, that we have a, a soft heart uh, in order to aid those who need help and and those who need to hear your truth dear lord we pray that the the riches of your word that we we possess that we would be willing to share among our uh, neighbors in our community we pray these things in your son's name jesus christ amen